Hi everyone and welcome to our module on the thyroid gland. Let's start by reviewing the anatomy of the thyroid. You may know that it sits in the neck just in front of the trachea as shown in this picture down at the bottom. It consists of two lobes, a right lobe and a left lobe. I'm circling these now with my pen. It also has a thin band of tissue between the two lobes and that is called the isthmus. And then sometimes there's an extra lobe sitting above the isthmus and that is called the pyramidal lobe. The blood supply is from the superior and inferior thyroid arteries. The superior thyroid artery is shown here on the screen. It's the first branch of the external carotid artery on either side. The inferior thyroid artery is not shown on the screen. It is a branch of the thyrocervical trunk, which comes off the subclavian artery on the left and on the right. In the fetus, the thyroid forms from epithelial cells in the floor of the pharynx. Basically, it begins as cells at the base of the mouth and in the tongue that dive down into the neck to form the thyroid. If we look at the drawing on the bottom left side of the screen here, this is an illustration of a 24 to 28 day old embryo. And there are structures here like the eye that you may recognize. And in the middle of the embryo, there are these bumps, and those are called the pharyngeal arches. If we were to dissect this fetus and look down on it in this direction, we would see something like this picture on the right side of the screen. Each of these bumps here is one of the pharyngeal arches. These are called the pharyngeal grooves between each arch. And in the middle of the fetus, there are these structures called the pharyngeal pouches. And at the center of those pouches, there are two important structures. One's called the corpula, and the other one is called the tuberculum impar. And right between the corpula and the tuberculum impar, there is a structure called the thyroid diverticulum. This is an outgrowth from the floor of the pharynx that is going to dive down into the neck and form the thyroid. So as that tissue from the pharynx descends into the neck, it will initially in the fetus maintain its connection to the tongue. This is a structure called the thyroglossal duct, and this will disappear later in development. And in the adult, there are two remnants of this thyrogosyl duct that you can find. The first one is called the foramen cecum in the tongue. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. And the second one is that pyramidal lobe of the thyroid we saw before. When that remains behind, that is a remnant of the thyrogosyl duct. Shown on the screen is a drawing of the tongue, obviously. And this indentation here is called the median sulcus. And where it ends, right there, that is the foramen cecum. And that is a remnant of the thyroglossal duct. That is where the thyroid began to form in the fetus. From this point in the tongue, it dove down into the neck to form the thyroid gland. Some patients have what's called a thyroglossal duct cyst. This is a persistent remnant of the thyroglossal duct. It presents as a midline neck mass that's often noticed by the patient, as shown in this example on the screen here. It's usually painless, but the patient will present it to their doctor out of concern for the growth in the neck. It's usually discovered in children. And classically, it will move up with swallowing or tongue protrusion. And this is because it's a remnant of the thyroglossal duct and it still has some connection to the mouth and the tongue. And that's why it moves when you swallow or protrude the tongue. And sometimes it even contains thyroid cells when you remove the neck mass and look at it under the microscope. Sometimes babies are born with what's known as an ectopic thyroid. This is functioning thyroid tissue outside of the gland. And now that you understand the embryology of the thyroid, it's easy to understand why the most common location for ectopic thyroid tissue is at the base of the tongue. Basically, some thyroid tissue gets left behind and does not descend into the neck. This will present as a mass in the tongue. It's commonly detected at a time when there's a high demand for hormones. So when children enter puberty or when women become pregnant, there is an increased demand for thyroid hormone. Sometimes this will lead to stimulation and growth of that thyroid tissue in the tongue and then patients will notice the mass and present to their physician. Occasionally, this is the only functioning thyroid tissue present. In other words, there is thyroid tissue in the tongue, but not anywhere else in the neck. And when this happens, sometimes patients underproduce thyroid hormone. This leads to hypothyroidism. This can create a vicious cycle where the hypothyroidism raises the level of TSH. We'll talk about TSH later. And the TSH stimulates growth of the ectopic tissue, and thus the mass in the tongue becomes larger. When this is the case and you remove the mass, the patient will have hypothyroidism after the surgery and they will need to go on hormone replacement therapy. When you look at normal thyroid tissue under the microscope, what you see are the presence of structures called follicles. These are shown on the screen. There are these big circular structures here. They're lined by cells and they have proteinaceous material in the middle, which is called colloid. A single layer of epithelial cells lines each follicle and these are called the follicular cells. And these are the cells that are going to synthesize thyroid hormone for the body. Thyroid hormones contain the element iodine. So in order to have normal levels of thyroid hormone in your body, you need to consume normal amounts of iodine in your diet. Decades ago, lots of patients used to underconsume iodine and develop thyroid disease, but this is very rare in the modern era. And that's because most of the salt we eat in our diet is called iodized salt. So most table salt you buy in the store is mixed with a small amount of iodine. This is done in many countries to prevent iodine deficiency. 
Iodine began being added to salt in the United States in 1924, and as a result of adding iodine to salt, deficiency of iodine and symptomatic thyroid disease from lack of iodine is very rare in modern countries. There are two thyroid hormones in the human body. One is called T3, the other is called T4. The bottom left side of the screen is the structure of T3. It's also called triiodothyronine, and you can see that it has one, two, three iodine molecules, hence the name T3. The bottom right side of the screen is the structure of T4, which is also called thyroxine, and T4, as you can imagine, has four iodine molecules, hence the name T4. Both of them are synthesized from the amino acid tyrosine, and I've shown you tyrosine structure on the screen here. You can see that it has a benzene ring and a hydroxyl group, and tyrosine molecules are going to be combined with iodine in order to create T3 and T4. In order to understand how T3 and T4 are synthesized by the thyroid gland, you need to understand the structure of thyroglobulin. This is a large protein that is produced by those follicular cells we saw before in the thyroid gland, and it contains numerous tyrosine molecules. So on the screen is a drawing of how you can picture thyroglobulin. It's got all these tyrosines sticking off of it. And what the thyroid gland is going to do is convert these tyrosines into T3s and T4s, which will ultimately become the thyroid hormone used by the body. Also, to understand how thyroid hormone is synthesized, you need to understand some more details about the chemical element iodine. So when we use the word iodine, we are referring to the atomic structure of the chemical element iodine, which has atomic number 53. When we use the word iodide, we mean an iodine atom bound to some other atom. Often it's called an iodide salt because it's bound to a positively charged atom, and that gives the iodine a negative charge. So for example, you can find lots of iodine as potassium iodide. This means iodine is bound to the positively charged potassium molecule, and this gives the iodine a negative charge. And plasma iodine in our body exists as numerous different iodide salts. In order to incorporate iodine into thyroid hormone, the iodide in our diet needs to undergo several different changes. First of all, it has to be taken up by follicular cells, it then has to be oxidized to I2. This means it needs to undergo the process of oxidation. And then finally, it needs to be added to organic or carbon structures, and this process is called organification. And we're going to talk about these three steps of incorporating iodine into thyroid hormone. They're very high yield for you to know for step one. So the first step is iodine uptake by cells of the thyroid gland. On the screen, I've drawn a follicular cell of the thyroid gland. Over here is the plasma, and over here, is the lumen of one of the follicles in the thyroid gland. That's where the thyroglobulin is sitting with all those tyrosine residues waiting to become thyroid hormone. There is a protein pump in the membrane of follicular cells called NIS, which stands for sodium iodine symporter. And as the name implies, it will bring iodine into the cell along with sodium. Now remember, a lot of the iodide sitting in plasma is part of a salt, so it is iodine with a negative charge. And this symporter can also import other negatively charged ions like perchlorate, which is chloride bound to four oxygens, or protectinate, which is technetium bound to four oxygens. Both of these can also be picked up by the NIS symporter, and that means that they can compete with iodine, and therefore they are inhibitors of the NIS pump. Once iodine atoms are inside the cell, the next step in thyroid hormone synthesis is oxidation of iodine to I2. The enzyme that catalyzes this step is called thyroid peroxidase, or TPO. This is a multifunctional enzyme, and as we will see, it catalyzes many of the steps involved in the synthesis of thyroid hormone. So in addition to oxidation, it also catalyzes the next step in synthesis of thyroid hormone, and that is the organification, which means adding iodine to organic molecules, and those organic molecules are the tyrosine residues on thyroglobulin sitting in the follicles of the thyroid gland. Thyroid peroxidase catalyzes the addition of iodine to tyrosine. If you add one iodine atom, you will create a molecule called monoiodotyrosine, or MIT. If you add two iodine atoms, you will create a molecule called diiodotyrosine, or DIT. And these get synthesized on those tyrosine residues sitting on the thyroglobulin structures in the follicle of the thyroid gland. The next step after synthesis of MIT and DIT is to couple those molecules together to make molecules of thyroid hormone. And this step is also catalyzed by thyroid peroxidase. So if you add an MIT molecule to a DIT molecule, you will get a structure that has two benzene rings and three iodines, one from the MIT and two from the DIT. That will be a molecule of triiodothyronine, or T3. If thyroid peroxidase combines two DIT molecules, you will get a thyroid hormone structure that has four iodines, and that is thyroxine, or T4. So just to review, thyroid peroxidase is a multifunctional enzyme that catalyzes several steps in synthesis of thyroid hormone. 
It catalyzes the oxidation of iodide. It catalyzes the organification of iodine into MIT and DIT. And it catalyzes the coupling of MIT and DIT into T3 and T4. And as we will talk about in another module, antibodies to the TPO enzyme are common in autoimmune thyroid diseases. So here's a slide that puts together all the steps involved in synthesis of thyroid hormone. You begin with iodide salts in the plasma. The NIS symporter brings them into follicular cells where thyroid peroxidase oxidizes iodine atoms into I2. I2 is then added to tyrosine residues, which are present on thyroglobulin, also by the enzyme TPO. This is a process called organification. This results in the presence of MIT and DIT molecules attached to thyroglobulin. TPO then carries out coupling reactions and combines the MIT and DIT molecules into T3 and T4 molecules in the follicular lumen. Thyroglobulin together with those T3 and T4 molecules is then brought into the cell and it undergoes proteolysis. Basically what happens is the T3, T4 molecules are split off from the thyroglobulin this results in the release of T3 and T4 into the plasma. Although follicular cells can produce both T3 and T4, T4 is the major hormone produced by your thyroid gland. More than 90% of the hormone that's produced is T4. T3, however, is a more potent hormone than T4. T3 is a more potent activator of the thyroid hormone receptor. And the way most of the T3 in your body gets synthesized is by peripheral conversion of T4. So the T4 produced by the thyroid gland is a pro-hormone for T3. There is an enzyme found in most peripheral tissues called 5 prime diiodinase, and it can convert all that T4 produced by the thyroid gland into T3 locally within the tissues. If you look at the bottom left side of the screen here, this is the structure of T4. The enzyme 5 prime diiodinase can remove an iodine from the 5 prime position. That's how the enzyme gets its name, and when this iodine is removed, the structure you are left with is the structure of T3 or triiodothyronine. In another module, we will talk about treatment of hyperthyroidism, but I just want to point out here that many hyperthyroid medications inhibit either TPO or 5' diiodinase. So propothiouracil, or PTU, is a medication used to treat patients who are hyperthyroid. It inhibits TPO, which blunts the formation of T3 and T4 from the thyroid gland. PTU also inhibits 5' diiodinase, which blunts conversion of T4 to T3. There is another medication used for hyperthyroidism called methimazole, which inhibits only TPO, and both PTU and methimazole are in a class of drugs called thioamides, which inhibit thyroid gland production of thyroid hormone. And then finally, the beta blocker propranolol is a weak inhibitor of 5' diiodinase. This makes it an excellent drug for patients who are thyrotoxic and have hyperthyroidism. It will block the catecholamines that occur in hyperthyroidism, and it will also blunt the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. You might think that because thyroid hormone requires iodine, that if you consumed lots of iodine in your diet, you would have excessive thyroid hormone levels, but this is not the case. And the reason this doesn't occur is because of something called the wolf chaikoff effect, named for the scientists who discovered it. Excessive iodine in the diet could lead to hyperthyroidism, so our body has developed a protective mechanism, and that's called the wolf chaikoff effect. And the wolf chaikoff effect results in inhibition of organification when the level of iodide gets too high. This leads to less synthesis of MIT and DIT. And this probably developed evolutionarily to protect us from excess thyroid hormone in settings where we consumed too much iodide in our diet. Amiodarone is an antiarrhythmic drug. It's a class 3 antiarrhythmic commonly used to treat atrial fibrillation or sometimes ventricular fibrillation. But the reason I'm mentioning it here is because it contains iodine. That's why it has the letters IOD in its name. This is its structure at the bottom right side of the screen here. You can see that it contains two iodine atoms. And the reason I'm mentioning this in the thyroid module is because amiodarone can cause hypothyroidism. And the way it does this is via the wolf chaikoff effect. All this excess iodine coming from amiodarone can inhibit the production of thyroid hormone and lead to hypothyroidism. It also can cause hypothyroidism because it mimics T4. It can compete with T4 for the enzyme 5' diiodinase. As a result, there is less conversion of T4 into T3, and this is another mechanism by which patients on amiodarone can become hypothyroid. Because it competes with T4 for 5' diiodinase, there is a natural drop in T3 levels in patients who take amiodarone. This stimulates TSH release from the pituitary gland and there is a normal mild increase in TSH seen in all patients after they start amiodarone. Usually the level of TSH normalizes after they've been taking amiodarone for a little while, but this is one of the many reasons that you always need to check TSH before you start patients on amiodarone because it will begin to change after they start taking the drug. 
Iodine-131 is also called radioactive iodine. It is an isotope of iodine that has 53 protons, just like elemental iodine, but it has extra neutrons. For this reason, it will emit radiation via the process of beta decay. So patients who are exposed to radioactive iodine will have the radioactive iodine taken up by their thyroid gland. It competes with elemental iodine for uptake, and it will concentrate in the thyroid gland. Radioactive iodine is used medically for two purposes. It's sometimes given in a small dose to concentrate in the thyroid gland so that you can image the thyroid gland. Although another isotope of iodine, iodine-123, is also often used for this purpose. In a large dose, iodine-131 can be used to destroy thyroid tissue. This is used as a therapy for hyperthyroidism. So patients who are hyperthyroid can receive radioactive iodine their thyroid gland will be ablated, and then after that, they can take thyroid supplementation, and their hypothyroidism will be cured. Thyroxin binding globulin, or TBG, is an important carrier molecule for thyroid hormone. As I mentioned before, most of the thyroid hormone found in your plasma is T4, and T4 as well as T3 is poorly soluble in water, so it needs help to carry it through the serum, and that help comes from TBG. Most of the T4 in your plasma is bound to TBG. Smaller amounts are bound to albumin, and there is some bound to a molecule called transthyretin. TBG is actually present in the smallest amount of these three structures here. However, it has the highest affinity for thyroid hormones, so as a result, most of your T4 is bound to TBG, and it's produced in the liver and found in the plasma. A key point that you need to understand is that when there is less TBG in the plasma, there will be a smaller pool of available T4 and T3 to tissues. Basically, there is always a large pool of T4 bound to TBG sitting in the plasma ready to be used. A little bit of the T4 will dissociate and be free in the plasma. If you lower the amount of TBG in your plasma, then you have a smaller pool available. This is relevant in a couple of scenarios. First of all, estrogen can raise TBG levels. Estrogen slightly modifies the TBG molecules, and this slows their clearance from plasma. So women who are pregnant or women who take oral contraceptive pills can see a rise in their TBG levels, and this will raise their total T4 levels if you measure it in the serum. To understand how this happens, let's take a look at this concept map. If there is a rise in your TBG level, those extra TBG molecules will soak up T4 so that there is more bound T4 in the plasma. This will mean that there is less free T4 in the plasma, so these patients will transiently see a small drop in their T4 level. This will be sensed by the pituitary gland and there will be a rise in thyroid stimulating hormone. This will stimulate the thyroid gland to synthesize more T4 so that there is an increase in total T4. When the total T4 level goes up, that will increase the free T4 level so it goes back to normal. And then the TSH level will fall and also go back to normal. So among women who are pregnant or women who take oral contraceptive pills, you will see an increase in the total T4 level in the setting of a normal free T4 level and a normal TSH level. Liver failure does the opposite of estrogen. It lowers TBG levels. That's because the liver produces TBG, so there's less production of the protein in liver failure, and this can lower total T4 levels via the opposite mechanism I just described. Thyroid hormone exerts its effect on cells via the thyroid hormone receptor. This is part of a family of nuclear receptors. They are all hormone-activated transcription factors, and the net result is that thyroid hormone exerts its effect on cells by modulating gene expression. There are many, many effects of thyroid hormone on the cells of the body, but one way you can remember them all is by remembering that thyroid hormone is a major regulator of metabolic activity and growth. So as we will see, it has an impact on glucose and lipid metabolism. It can also influence cardiac function, and then in terms of growth, thyroid hormone is very important for normal bone growth and normal CNS development. In terms of metabolic effects, it can speed up carbohydrate metabolism, it can increase the rate of glycogen breakdown, it can also speed up gluconeogenesis, it also raises the rate of fat metabolism, it does this through a number of mechanisms, it increases the rate of lipolysis, it lowers concentrations of cholesterol and triglycerides, thyroid hormone has been shown to increase the number of LDL receptors on the liver, and this leads to lower LDL cholesterol, and then finally it increases the rate of cholesterol secretion into bile. And it's important you remember these effects for when we talk about the symptoms of hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. So hypothyroidism is a classic cause of elevated cholesterol for these reasons right here. When you have a decreased amount of thyroid hormone, you have a slowing of fat metabolism and the cholesterol level will rise. In any patient who presents with hypercholesterolemia, one of the things you need to exclude is thyroid disease. In patients who are hyperthyroid, they often have hyperglycemia, and that's because carbohydrate metabolism is being sped up there's more glycogen breakdown and more gluconeogenesis. 
Another very important effect of thyroid hormone is that it can raise your basal metabolic rate. So what is your basal metabolic rate? That's the rate of energy use in your body if you just slept all day. If you didn't move or do anything exertional, you would still consume a certain amount of energy in order to keep your body going, and that is your basal metabolic rate. And that rate is increased by thyroid hormone. And one of the best described ways in which it does this is by increasing the number of sodium potassium ATPase pumps found in cells in the body. I've listed a nice paper at the bottom of the screen if you want to read more about this effect, but it's been well described for thyroid hormone, and it's probably one of the most important ways in which it raises your basal metabolic rate. When there are more pumps and cells in the body, this means more ATP is consumed. This means the body will have an increase in oxygen demand so it can replenish the ATP. This will raise the respiratory rate to meet that oxygen demand. In addition, using all that ATP for all those pumps will raise the body temperature. And this has an important clinical correlation when it comes to hyperthyroid patients. They often have weight loss because they are burning so much energy. In addition, sometimes they feel hot and they complain that they feel hot all the time. And that's because their body temperature is rising from the excess thyroid hormone. Sometimes hyperthyroid patients also have an increased respiratory rate. And it's for the reasons I've shown on this slide. In the heart, thyroid hormone can raise the heart rate, the cardiac output, the stroke volume, and the contractility. One of the ways it does this that has been well described is by increasing the number of beta-1 receptors in the heart so that catecholamines exert a greater effect. And once again, this has a clinical implication when it comes to patients who are hyperthyroid. They are often tachycardic, and that's via this mechanism shown here. Thyroid hormone also has important central nervous system and bone effects, especially in children as they are growing. Thyroid hormone is required for normal bone growth and CNS maturation. And so if hypothyroidism occurs during childhood, this can lead to a severe developmental syndrome known as cretinism. Children with cretinism have stunted growth and intellectual disability, along with a number of other features, and I'll show you a picture of this in a few slides. We don't see this much in the modern era, but decades ago, when there was no way to diagnose or treat thyroid disease in childhood, children born with rare problems making thyroid hormone would go on to develop cretinism. Some of the potential causes of cretinism include iodine deficiency in parts of the world where malnutrition is common. Rarely children are born with an abnormally formed thyroid. This is called thyroid dysgenesis, and this can lead to cretinism. And then there are also rare inborn errors of thyroid hormone synthesis. This is called dyshormonogenesis. And when this occurs, this can lead to cretinism. The most common enzyme involved in dyshormonogenesis is thyroid peroxidase. Thyroid hormone deficiency is the most common treatable cause of intellectual disability. There are many causes of intellectual disability, including Down syndrome, but many of those other causes are not treatable. Most babies born with a deficiency in producing thyroid hormone will appear normal, and that's because in utero, they were able to receive T3 and T4 from the mother because it can cross the placenta. Only after birth will they begin to be exposed to low levels of thyroid hormone. And in many countries, including most parts of the United States, there are newborn screening programs. So when babies are born, either a T4 or a TSH is measured from a heel stick blood specimen. And the idea here is to screen for hypothyroidism, and if it's present, to treat it early so the child does not go on to develop the clinical syndrome of cretinism. This is a picture of a child with cretinism shown on the slide here. The clinical features are intellectual disability, coarse facial features, and short stature. Another classic finding is an umbilical hernia, like shown here, and also a large tongue, also shown in this picture on the screen. The amount of thyroid hormone produced by follicular cells of the thyroid gland is regulated by TSH, which is also called thyrotropin. TSH is released by the anterior pituitary gland. It binds to receptors on follicular cells and stimulates them to release more thyroid hormone. It works via a cyclic AMP protein kinase A second messenger system, and it's high yield to remember this fact for step one. And there are a number of mechanisms by which TSH increases the amount of T3 and T4 released by the thyroid gland. First of all, it can increase the rate of proteolysis of thyroglobulin. This leads to a rapid release of T3 and T4 very quickly when the TSH level goes up. Then more slowly over time, it can stimulate thyroid cell growth and also stimulate thyroglobulin synthesis. And these mechanisms lead to a sustained increase in the amount of T3 and T4 released by the thyroid gland. TSH itself is controlled by another hormone called TRH, or thyroid-releasing hormone, which is released by the hypothalamus. So there are multiple layers of regulation of thyroid hormone synthesis. The thyroid gland is controlled by TSH, which comes from the pituitary, and then TSH 
is controlled by TRH, which comes from the hypothalamus. When the level of thyroid hormone in the plasma rises, this exerts negative feedback inhibition on both the release of TSH from the anterior pituitary and the release of TRH from the hypothalamus. When the level of thyroid hormone falls, that negative feedback inhibition is released. As a result, TRH is released from the hypothalamus, and then TSH is released from the anterior pituitary, and that will stimulate the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. Pregnancy has multiple effects on thyroid hormone production. As we discussed previously, there is a rise in TBG levels driven by estrogen. This leads to a rise in the total plasma T4 and T3 levels. In this chart on the bottom of the screen, I've shown weeks of pregnancy along the x-axis and TBG and total T4 climb as the pregnancy progresses. In addition, HCG stimulates the thyroid to some degree. Recall that HCG and TSH have the same alpha unit. So HCG can stimulate the thyroid to some degree, and this will raise the free T4 level a little bit, especially early in pregnancy. In response, the TSH level will fall. Therefore, early in pregnancy, you see this climb in the free T4 level and a fall in the TSH level. As pregnancy progresses, that effect will wane. There are four standard measurements that are used to assess thyroid function. It's called the thyroid panel. You will send these blood tests on many of your patients on your clinical rotations. First of all, the TSH is measured, followed by the total T4, the total T3, and the free T4 level in the plasma. On the right side of this chart, I've shown the normal values for each of these blood tests. You don't need to know the exact numbers, but I want to point out a couple things that should make sense to you. First of all, the T4 level is much higher than the T3 level. Note that the normal total T4 is 60 to 145, while the normal total T3 is 1 to 3. And that's because, as we described before, the thyroid gland mostly produces T4. It produces relatively little T3, so total T4 is always much higher than T3 in the plasma. Note also that the total T4 is much greater than the free T4, and that should also make sense to you because, as we described before, most T4 is bound to TBG, and therefore there is a relatively small amount of free T4 found in the serum. There is one other hormone produced by the thyroid gland other than thyroid hormone, and that is the hormone calcitonin. Calcitonin is synthesized by cells in the thyroid gland called parafollicular cells. They're also called C cells. If you look at this image on the screen, we've been talking about cells that surround the follicles. Those are the follicular cells. But there are also other cells, like this one right here, which can be found, and they're called parafollicular or C cells. And those are the cells that secrete calcitonin. The major physiologic effect of calcitonin is to lower serum calcium. That's why it gets the name calcitonin. It does this through a number of mechanisms. It suppresses the resorption of bone by inhibiting osteoclasts. It also inhibits the renal reabsorption of calcium and phosphorus, and this leads to increased calcium excretion in the urine. It probably plays a minor role in calcium handling in humans. The major role of regulating calcium levels in humans is done through parathyroid hormone. But the main thing to know about calcitonin in terms of clinical medicine is that it can be used as pharmacologic therapy for patients with hypercalcemia. In patients with significantly increased serum calcium who are symptomatic, you can administer calcitonin and it will rapidly lower the serum calcium level. And that concludes our module on the thyroid gland.